Stop, stop looking at that clock. Oh yeah, we're late. No, it's correct now. Good. Okay. Um, how did the exam go? Got one laugh, some grins. Not. Uh, Best weekend of your life? Well, you should have started last Wednesday then. You did? All right. Well, um, I'll grade them, and, um, and then we will, we will discuss it when I grade it, and I'll give you a full solution and, and all that, okay? Um, I'm sure, yeah, there were some... Go ahead, Chris. Go for it. Um, if you haven't got all of that worked out yet, it's okay. You still have time. But um, now that you know how to do those, um, yeah, that's, that would be, if you want to sort of keep a reasonable pace and not have to do it all at, at the end, that would be a good idea for sure. Um, the, uh, yeah, there, there were a few things on the exam that, um, I mean, hopefully, I mean, I've t tested you well to whether you could... Uh, whether you understood some of the concepts and um, the um, regardless of how you do you're going to want to make sure to review this carefully and um, and get up to speed I mean the main thing I want when you guys walk out of this class is that you guys can model these kind of systems and uh, and that's at the end so we got five more weeks if you uh, felt like you, you did fine you're good and if if uh, you need to work some, then we, we still got plenty of time, and I'll help you work on that, okay? So, um, I also uh, graded all the proposals and sent out that note Friday night. Um, I put comments on many of them, or all of them. I mean, you should, so read the embedded comments in the PDF, and then I had a little rubric there that sort of gave you a gauge on whether you met those um, basic topics that I listed in the proposal statement um, on the website. Any questions? Uh, well, I guess I want to say a few things. A couple of common things. Um, I'm really excited about the projects. I think there's a lot of cool things uh, that you guys are thinking of, so um, that that's neat, and, um, and I liked reading them more formally um, explained. The uh, couple things that I saw in a lot of papers, though, were, um, let's see, um, Few people explained their system in terms of the um, language and notation um, and kinematic information that we've been going over in class. So just saying, well, I've got three reference frames attached to these three bodies. Uh, these are my reference frames, and then these are the generalized coordinates that would connect or would um, set the orientation with the reference frames. And here's some particular points. Um, I was hoping to see more, you know, more of the language of the class um, used to express those. It's very difficult to express um, complex motion in three-dimensional space uh, without like a lot of pictures and a lot of text and, and, and equations often. And, uh, and so some of the things I looked at, and you had a schematic maybe, but I really couldn't understand exactly um, how the machine worked and what, or, or thing worked and how and what you were going to focus on. So that is going to need to be improved on a lot, on a lot of them. Um, the, another thing too is um, quite a few of you didn't um, use sort of a standard uh, citation format. So you, I'm hoping that how many of you um, have not come across a citation format in previous reports and things that you've written? Like uh, guidelines. Everybody's seen that. So there's things like the MLA standard for citations, or IEEE has a standard. Um, different journals have have different ones. Um, IEEE standard is probably pretty common in engineering papers. So uh, when you do your when you cite your work, uh, make sure to use something that's. I don't care which one you use really, as long as it's some kind of consistent format that's accepted. Um, and uh, when you just do it ad hocly, it's not, it's, um, you may not, you may be missing information there. 
Okay, so like just pasting in a URL in, in your text is not is not really sufficient. Make a make a full citation for that. Another thing is um, for for schoolwork. I, I harp on this because I'm very interested in um, copyright and uh, open access publishing in particular. But uh, you can't necessarily use images from other people's work, right? It's uh, it's copy. It's generally copyrighted. And uh, you can't just copy and paste an image into your report. For schoolwork, it's it's accepted under sort of fair use rules. And um, but for anything you all end up publishing, you, you're not going to be able to do that. So I think it's better to get into the habit of um, not taking copyrighted images from other stuff. Right? Either make a sketch yourself if you need to uh, communicate something similarly. Um, you, you theoretically would have to, you could ask the author of that, can I use your, can I put your thing in my, my paper? And they may say yes, and then you're okay. Or you can also um, uh, look for images that have um, licenses, like the Creative Commons license, that allow you to do it without asking permission from the author. So I would get in the habit of that, and I would, I would like to see for the final report that um, we'd, you know, we minimize that, right, um, use of other people's graphics and things. So you're going to have to work, work on those and um, think about how to um, do that. What else? Um, some of the literature searches were a little weak. Like, you know, if you looked at one or two, found one or two things, um, there's probably more out there. There's a... Uh, I'm not going to get the quote right, but um, Andrew, Andrew Nyung, Nyung, I'm not going to say his right, name right, but famous Stanford AI professor that teaches like a big AI course in Coursera and has worked for, um, what's the Chinese um, search engine company, Baidu? Is it Baidu? And, um, and such. He, uh, saw, he, get, he said a quote one time about his, uh, eth uh, uh, his method of... Um, Sort of being successful in um, in research, and one of, and one of the main points he made was that uh, you've got to read lots of papers, right? So, as you, in your tenure as a graduate student, um, the more you read of different people's work, the better off you're going to be, right? You got to consume a lot of papers. I were, you know, in my PhD, I, I don't think I could count how many paper papers I ended up reading, but hundreds, right? And, uh, and you've got to get meticulous, too, about reading them and taking good notes and have a, have a way to keep track of that information. And, um, but really, reading papers just over and over, even if you don't understand them, you, you'll, you'll eventually understand them. But uh, you have to force yourself to like, get into that pattern of reading lots of papers. And you'll see how people write. You'll see how people explain things. And then you will also see this sort of start to hit and see that cutting edge um, where you're trying to get to, right? You want to you sort of put yourself in a place to understand the breadth of things in your field and, and then see where some of the holes are. And you can't do that without reading a lot of papers and, um, and getting in a good habit of that. So um, two, or two, two, two citations was probably not enough, but, you know, Four or five or something is, is was better. So I'd like to see, you know, as you move forward, make sure to um, look up some more papers. Right, they're out there. They're not always easy to find, um, but there should be some other relevant, relevant things. Any other questions on the proposal or in the comments I gave back on that? I guess the last thing I have then is, um, unless you aced it, come and talk to me. Right, let's let's get this. Uh, Let's stand up at the whiteboard and draw your reference frames and, and like get this thing ha hashed out, right? Because it's not, it's not going to be easy. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm happy to help you and lend you my time, but you've got to come visit me. Okay? But they look fun, and I think we're going to have a good time um, figuring those out. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll do my best to get the uh, exams graded and... Um, Probably, probably not going to happen by tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, but we'll, we'll probably talk about it next Monday would be the more likely scenario. The 
Okay, so what we ended on before uh, the, um, what we ended on last Wednesday was uh, partial velocities, and I um, didn't really tell you why we're going to need them, um, but these partial velocities, if you have any velocity vector, whether it's a vector that's associated with the velocity of a, a point moving, a linear velocity, or an angular velocity that's associated with the reference frame um, spinning or mo um, angularly, uh, with angular orientation. Um, these vectors can all be expressed as linear functions of the generalized speeds that you choose. And these partial velocities ultimately tell you um, if I give a unit change in some given generalized speed, that particular velocity will, will change in some amount in both a direction and a magnitude because partial velocities are partial vectors. They're, they're, they're a vector. And, um, and they're, um, you can figure them out by inspection. right? If you look at a velocity expression, you can look for the coefficients of the generalized speeds. Um, or you could take the partial derivative of that vector with respect to that particular speed you're interested in and get a hold of the partial velocities. Questions on those, Chris? Understanding your question perfectly. Well, the, you mentioned the kinematic. I think you were talking about the kinematic differential equations that relates the q dots to the u's. Right? You pick some generalized speeds, whatever expressions you want, and they are functions of q dots. So, those, and those equations look like. Um, I'll make sure I don't screw up the notation. Right, that's the vector form, or right. And these are the You get to choose what these are. Right, so that's where you were, that's, you mentioned those. Can you set it as this? Can you set it? What do you mean? Can you set it up the same way? Um, yeah, potentially. Um, yeah, you're, th you're thinking of this. Like, if I uh, we wrote, we didn't write them in, in vector format. But say I want to call the how would, uh, what notation should I use here? So let's just These would be uh, v1, v2, 
V3. And then this matrix, I'll just call this A and B for the time being. Right. We know that these are in linear, these are um, uh, linear with respect to the U's. And so you could populate this. But it's a little odd because you're populating this with vectors, right, not scalars. So, I'd, so it, it, it could be useful as a, um, like in the, in the computational sense, in the, in the SymPy sense, a way to group those things together in some organized fashion. But uh, as far as a proper matrix there, I'm not sure that flies completely because they're not, not scalars. But yeah, it's, it's, it's related. I mean, it's, it's the same kind of relationship. Um, think about that. All right, any other questions on the generalized, I mean, on the uh, partial velocities? So I want to say a few more things about the uh, partial velocities. There's um, one more um, detail associated with um, non-holonomic systems. So we showed you these partial velocity relationships for um, essentially only holonomic sy uh, systems when I ended last Wednesday. But sometimes um, these U's, uh, some of them are dependent on the other U's, right, if we have motion constraints. So I want to say a couple things about that to start. And um, <clears throat> what up? Let me get back to my, where I was at. Yeah, so, i just block that off. So we divine these uh, partial velocities, if I have some vector v, that is a velocity vector, then I can write this like so. Now me disappeared. Right, and this is for n generalized speeds. So that's the case, right, if we have uh, gen a number of generalized speeds that equal the number of non-minimal configuration constraints, All right? But we don't always have that. If we have motion constraints, uh, then we have P equals N minus M. then we're going to have P independent GCs, I mean, sorry, generalized speeds. And in that case, we're going to specifically call this the Arth holonomic partial velocity, All right? And then similarly, we can define um, for a non-holonomic system, and I'm going to use a tilde to designate the difference here. Oops, sorry, not on the v. Some vector v can then be broken up as the sum from r equals one to p of the arth non-holonomic partial velocity plus the non-holonomic re remainder term. And so this term is now the arth non-holonomic right? And the key thing is we, ju we just have fewer of them in a non-holonomic system. And if you, exp you can express, remember, you can express any velocity, any vector, velocity vector, 
in terms of strictly the independent speeds, if you substitute in um, the relationships that you develop from your motion constraints. We could re-express those and not have any of the dependent speeds in those equations. Right? So we really only, um, we only have these few independent speeds there. So, the, I think I just want to show, let me see, I don't want to say anything else here. Okay, that, that's, that's all. And then maybe just to remind you, there's, there's the corollary for angular, for any, any angular velocity too. Arth. Doesn't like that line. Disappeared three times. All right, so we have the linear and angular velocities there. So let me show an example. Does anybody not have that page? So this is figure 2.13.1 two, in the book. It's identical to the problem we've already dealt with, where we just had two points here on a line, P1 and P2. Uh, the difference in this one is <clears throat> we've added a disk there. And that disk has a um, lateral no-slip condition. Okay, So if I lay this disk on that plane, the motion of the disk is, is now going to be constrained, right? Much, much like our rolling uh, wheels that we've done. Uh, but this one just slides and then um, has a laterally, a body fixed lateral motion constraint such that the velocity in this EY vector at that contact point, D1, can't, has a velocity equal to zero. All right, so same problem, except we're going to have a motion constraint here to deal with. So there's still um, three GCs, three generalized coordinates, Q1, Q2, and Q3. All right, Q1 and Q2 locate this point, and then Q3 is the angle here. And remember, this is just, um, it's not a generalized coordinate, it is a uh, uh, defined as a constant angular velocity of this plane B rotating in A. Okay, so three generalized coordinates, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And we can choose the generalized speeds in, a, in an infinite number of ways, really. But let me just write down a couple of these velocity terms, and this is the same as we uh, saw before. I'm going to pick. go ahead and pick some... generalized speeds here and define them as such. All right, so the velocity of P1 is U2, Q2. So in this case, U1 equals Q1 dot, U2 equals Q2 dot. So very, very simple definitions. And then um, it also has this, com this term associated with that constant angular velocity of point P1 in that block. And then the velocity, B D star is the center of the disk. So the velocity of D star in A is going to be the velocity of P1 in A plus omega of E in A crossed with L 
E X. All right, same, same thing that we had before. We can then write out, we're going to need this omega of E and A. We can use the addition theorem. Write this out in terms of two simple rotations. And that's going to be omega sine Q3 EX plus omega cosine 3 EY plus, here I'll define U3 as Q3 dot. All right, so I just picked sim very, the simplest possible definitions of the generalized speeds in this case. And then I've written the velocity of P1, the angular velocity of E and A in terms of the U's. And then I could complete this velocity of D star now that I have all those terms. I'll get U1 EX plus U2 plus L U3 EY minus omega Q1 plus L cosine Q3 EZ. All right doing that cross product. So now we have the velocity of the center of mass of, the, of uh, that disk D, the center of that disk D. And I'm not going to derive this explicitly here, but The no slip lateral no lateral slip constraint is going to be we can say that the velocity of d star dotted with ey hat has got to be zero. What frame should that velocity of d star be expressed in? No, which should be this left or be uh, uh, computed with respect to. B. Okay, so the, the no slip is really between D and B. We can't have this lateral motion uh, between those two reference frames. So this, is, this would be B. And if you write those out, you're going to end up with a motion constraint that looks like this. Some function of the two U's, um, U2 and U3 in this case, two of the U's, and uh, one in that constant term L, the distance. So at this point, We have this single motion constraint. It's going to reduce the degrees of freedom by one. Right? So now we're down to two degrees of freedom. And this relationship um, has got to hold. Which, which one of those U's are the independent speed, is the independent speed, and which one is the dependent speed in this problem? U3 be dependent. How many people agree that U3 is the, should be the dependent speed? Nobody agrees? You guys are dazed after my exam, I can tell. It doesn't matter. 
which one of these two. It has to be one of these two. It can't be you uh, one. But this just tells us a relationship between you two and three. We get to choose whatever one we want to be dependent. All right? So I can solve for you two, or I can solve for you three. In this case, I'll solve for you three. So we can say that u3 equals negative u2 over L. And now we're going to call this the independent generalized speed and that dependent generalized speed. Okay? And, so, and it's arbitrary. So we now have a couple, we have the velocity of d star in A and this um, omega E in A. And now, what, what are the partial velocities of those? Especially in the case that we have this um, non-holonomic constraint involved. So, for example, if we start with uh, V of D star in A, I can write the partial velocity with respect to U1, partial velocity with respect to u2, and the partial velocity with respect to u3. So what would these be? Take, take a couple minutes and write down what the partial velocities with respect to u1, u2, and u3 of v star, uh, vd star in A is. And, and the remainder term. Anybody know what the first partial velocity is? Speak up. Ex. I think that one's easy by an inspection. And then uh, one with respect to u2. Ey. And u u3.
Anybody got got that one for you three? There's no U threes. Oh no, I'm sorry. It is L E Y, right? So we do have we have a U three. And then the remainder term. So we took care of U N E X U two plus L three U. The rest of it here has no U's in it, and that's omega Q one plus L C three. Easy. Okay, so we got, gosh, what is this, delete, 2 equals EY, All right? So those are the holonomic partial velocities here. But we know that we could substitute this up into here to eliminate U3. So if we do that, we can then write the partial non-holonomic velocities the non holonomic partial velocities. So I'll use the, the tilde to designate those. And in this, and in this case, right, there's only two of those. And our independent speeds are going to be u1 and u2. And then we have a remainder term. All right, there'll only be two. So what will be the first non-holonomic partial velocity of d star in A? Stay the same. U1 wasn't involved in our motion constraint. So what about this one? What's the second partial non-holonomic partial velocity of d star in A? If we make that substitution. Zero, right? So I plug that in, that middle term goes away. And so then we just get zero. And then this is going to be the same. All right? So that's the difference here. Um, once we introduce motion constraints, we're all, we're gonna, we can have fewer partial velocities. And um, and as we see here, this there was a there was a change, right? They're not the same, and we're and we don't have to we don't have to deal with this, right? Because we can work with this reduced, simpler form in some sense. Same thing can, can be done with um, omega. So omega, I'm sorry, omega e and a. For example, the first partial velocity of omega e and a. We don't have any u1 or u2 terms, so they're going to be zero. And then the third partial velocity of ENA, there's a u3, so we get EZ. And then uh, a remainder. D star in A equals. Omega sine Q3 EX plus omega cosine 3 EY. And then similarly, we can write the non-holonomic partial velocities. Go ahead and write those out. Take a minute or two, a couple of minutes, and write the what those should be for the non-holonomic case.
it's omega one, the first non-holonomic partial, first non-holonomic partial angular velocity. Still zero, no u ones. And how about the second one? negative E z over L, right? So if I substitute in U3, for U3 my equation, I'll get that, and then the remainder term is going to be the same. All right? So I said last time that we were done with the kinematics chapter, but I uh, di didn't get to this. So this is the la last aspect here in the kinematics. Chris. So, is it better than to develop yeah, so the motion constraints, <clears throat> right, this is the motion constraint, but if I introduce it to all of the velocities in my, equa in my equations and then all the accelerations, um, I'm going to eliminate one of the degrees of freedom, and thus ultimately eliminate um, m um, equations from my formulation of f equals ma. And if you and if you eliminate that, you have this simpler, you have fewer equations, but they're going to be longer usually because these things, like when I introduced that, it made this equation a little more complicated. And so, ideally, yeah, you want to you want to um, put your all your velocities and accelerations in terms of the independent speeds. And then you will only need the non-holonomic partial velocities at that point to move forward. And we're going to show you how to use those soon. Um, here, let me, I'll say one more thing, too. I talked about how these partial velocities sort of decompose a velocity vector into um, different components. So say I have my partial velocities here. And So these are these <clears throat> de I've decomp decomposed the velocity vector into these um, components that are linear in the U's. And what these this shows us is that they are uh, if I make a unit change in a given U, that velocity vector will change in magnitude and direction in some way. Right? So they sort of tell us that. If you think of a particle here that has a mass m, then we can also think about this in terms of uh, forces. I think I want to go to a new page here to write the remainder. Oh, that was the wrong tool. Get the lasso. Okay, so if I think of a, a mass M there, and then we know that. Uh, Newton's law for linear motion looks like this. 
Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, acceleration is going to be dv dt. And that Newton's law relates the sum of the forces on there. So if I imagine a force being applied to that particle that causes this acceleration, A, <clears throat> then I could think about how these um, partial velocities relate to this force, in fact. And if I think about that this F vector divided by M dotted with a given partial velocity, right? So this is a direct, sort of a direction associated with one of the generalized speeds. Then you can imagine that, I think I'm going to screw up what I want to say, but you can, you can think about how um, this particular force will impart velocity in these, in these different components with respect to this relationship F equals MA. So this component here is um, the component of force, essentially, that causes motion in the U1 generalized speed. Right? So if I look at the component of F in any of these generalized speeds, it's going to cause a velocity in that direction and affect that generalized speed. And then you can then think about, too, if a partial velocity is perpendicular to F, then F doesn't cause any motion in the um, arth direction there. Okay? So, if VR is perpendicular to F, <clears throat> F can't cause any change in that, in that generalized speed, U, R. I don't know if I did a great job explaining that, but if you think about this mass, this particle, I apply a force, it's going to have an acceleration that's proportional to that force and will cause a velocity in that direction instantaneously. And if I project the force onto these partial velocities, I basically can determine how that force affects each of the generalized speeds. Okay? So if I push in this direction, um, if, I, if I align if I'm perpendicular to V3 and aligned with V2, I'm going to get a, all the change in U2, but none in V3. And then I'll get a little bit in V1, right, proportional to its projection under F. So this is a key. This alludes to how we're going to use this in F equals MA, right? We can sort of decompose the forces in terms of these generalized speeds to ultimately form these relationships. F equals MA, which is this equation that we're like after, right? This is the equation of motion of the system, and that is our ultimate goal to get to that. Um, not the ultimate goal, but we want to get that before we can do any kind of analysis of the motion. Questions there on that sort of interpretation of these, velo these partial velocities with respect to force?
Okay, let's take a five minute break and then when we come back we'll start chapter three the, and talk about mass distribution. Professor Kane, who wrote the book, is very um, good at being explicit in, in how they talk, describe these systems. I don't know if you've noticed that, how, how the language in the book so far. And um, so it's very hard, it's hard to, if you read the sentences and look at the picture, it's hard to um, misinterpret what, what the system is. So he spends a lot of time doing that. And I guarantee that each one of those sentences were carefully crafted to, to ensure that. And, um, and I think it's a good, uh, that, that book's a good role model in terms of our, how, how to try to talk about and express um, these complicated um, kinematic relationships and things. So just a, just a comment there. Let's get started here for the second half. Um, one, one comment was the exam way too long. How many, how many hours did people take on that? Don't want to know? <laughs> N number of hours total. What would you guess? Any, if you don't want to tell me publicly, that's fine too. 20 plus. Okay. And, uh, well, there's, there's a lot there, too, I guess. Um, and what's, did anybody have a low end? Was that high end, I think? Anybody, did everybody take that long? So it was awful. All right. Good to know. Um, okay. Thanks, thanks for that feedback. The, uh, and what, what do you think were the main, what were the main things that were you felt were keeping keeping it slow moving? Chris? Any other comments on uh, what, what, what slowed things down or what made it too long? It's harder, yeah. And that, uh, that does tie back. One of your comments, too, on the feedback was to... Um, do more examples with senpai, so I should I should do that. Huh? Um, <clears throat> how many people have found the set? Of, I sent out the list of examples um, too. Did you? All, how many people explored the other senpai examples? Just a couple of people, three people. So I I, don't know, I put a Piazza note up that had a directory full of I don't know. 
probably 15 SymPy examples for different dynamic systems. Um, I, think I would highly recommend checking those out. Um, and one of the folders in there has um, a large number of the, of the problems in the book done with SymPy. And uh, so the, that, that is a resource that I would recommend looking at. And I will, and I can, I can um, try to imp uh, add more, more SymPy examples too. Yeah, because it doesn't always, it doesn't always map one to one from uh, handwriting the equations to uh, how many people would want to write that acceleration by hand though? Um, problem one, sort of nasty. So that's why I want you to learn the tool. Um, it'll save. Many more hours. If I asked you to do that by hand, for example, um, you may have spent more than more time than you uh, did on this. Uh, it was maybe not. Maybe since this was the first big execution of SymPy, but uh, <clears throat> I've uh, Tom, uh, Professor Kane. One of the stories, Ek, Professor Eke, who just retired and taught this class last year, and I'm sort of taking over from him. He was one. Of the, he was a student of Thomas Kane's at Stanford. And uh, I may have already mentioned this, but uh, Professor Kane um, made everybody in the class do every single problem in the book by hand. And uh, some of them are, you know, nasty. So uh, I'm I'm not being, hopefully not being as 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 mean as him. But <laughs> this uh, it takes the other reality is that it 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 takes a it takes a level of Work to get to figure these things out. I, I can, you know, down do them faster, but um, they're they are meticulous. They're not. Uh, it's not. It's not trivial, and that's you know one thing I hope you see and realize that you have to be very careful about modeling um, these kinematics. Okay, and you'll you'll find with your system that you're going to do in your proposal um, that they're going to. It's going to take time, right? So so start on this early. And uh, the um, depending on what you've chosen, I think that most of them are reasonable, but some of them may have a few too de many degrees of freedom and things to deal with, and we can talk about that as we move forward. But um, you can um, can easily get in a level of complexity that uh, that will you have to spend a lot of time on, maybe more than you'd want for the for the class. So let's, we'll try to work on scaling those and scoping those. All right. Okay. Well, thank thank you for that feedback. I apologize for being that long. Um, yeah, that might be the advantage of doing an in-class exam. You only you got your hour or two, and we and we just finish it. So we could think about doing an in-class exam for the for the final instead, if you prefer. And the um, the only thing is, is I want you all. I was going to reserve that time for a whatever exam time we had for sort of a little lightning talk session of everybody's project. Everybody give a five to ten minute presentation. So if we would do the in-class exam, we would need to move that, try to do, set up a time outside of class to do that or something. I'll, I'll think about that. How many people would want a in-class exam at the, for the final? Two? How many would want a take home for the final? Still most want take home, even though it takes longer. Yeah. Yeah. But everybody has the time. To, well, I, I agree. Your the, the feeling is better. Um, but don't forget that everybody has a time constraint, and then I'm grading it on based on what everybody can do in that amount of time. And it's uh, Stephen. Yeah, I want one of the objectives is you ought to be uh, proficient at modeling systems with this tool out of the class. So I, I would, um, I want you to use that. Yes. Yes, I'm going to let you guys use open anything um, except people. On, on, even if it's an in-class exam, yeah, yeah, that's right. Change your vote now to in-class. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll check back in. Let's. Uh
let's, let's focus on new things, and um, we really want to get to these equations of motion, and uh, we're, we're reasonably close. So the kinematics, I promise you, the kinematics are the hard part, too, right? The rest of this is um, not as, I don't think it's as complicated. And, um, and, to, and, and it sort of reflects, too, when you have a whole system and you look at your SymPy code, it's like, you know, five-eighths to three-quarters of its kinematics, and then you got a few lines to, to do, the, do the final bit. So, all right. Mass distribution. Chapter 3. So, in um, the equations of motion, F equals MA, and the, um, or the time rate of change of the angular momentum and the um, time rate of change of the angular mo momentum equals the sum of the torques of all the system and the time rate of change of the linear momentum equals the sum of the forces on the system. Both of those have some uh, definition of uh, mass in there. For uh, the linear, we're going to have um, mass of particles. And, and then for rigid bodies, we're going to have a distribution of mass in that system. Okay, so <coughs> we're going to talk about particles and rigid bodies. And the first thing is that um, there's a concept of uh, moments of mass. And we're going to talk about the zeroth, the first and the second moments of mass. Um, for a particle, we just have a simple scalar m that represents the mass. And then for a rigid body, mass is some integral over the volume of a density with respect to some position vector, right? Every point in that rigid body may have a different density integrated over the volume, right? D capital V there. These are the, the zeroth moment of mass for particles in rigid bodies. Okay, so that's the first thing, that there is some value that each of these uh, particle rigid body has. And uh, to get the rigid body one, it's a little more complicated, especially if you have a non-uniform dense object, right? You've got to do, do that integral. The... Um, next thing is the mass center. So the mass center of a particle is is at the point of, at that particle's point. It's an infinitesimally small point, but a rigid body um, has a mass center, which is the average location um, or the average. Um, the location where the average, uh, I'm going to say that right, where the mass is on, a is on an average, right? Okay, so a formal definition here. Given a set particles that have a mass m1 through mv, which is the number of particles, located at different positions, right, that are indicated by these v position ve vectors. There's a point we'll call S star. <clears throat> and the star we're going to use a lot from now on to represent um, the center of mass. But there's this point S star so that the sum of mi ri equals 
zero. So if we add up, if we multiply those two, um, sorry. Where Ri is the distance, sorry, vector from S star to particles to particle I. Can you read my note? Right, the ith particle. And thus, S star is the mass center. Or, if we choose an arbitrary point O, I'm skipping ahead. Erase that sentence there. Um, I wanted to say that the first moment of mass, as opposed, we just talked about the zeroth, is zero relative to the mass center. Now, if we choose an arbitrary point O, from which any given Ri are measured, then the position vector to S star from O, and we're going to call that P bar star, we'll make that a colon, P bar star, is given by this equation. P bar star equals the sum from I equals 1 to V, MI, RI, all over the sum from I equals 1 to mu to nu MI. You may recognize this, right? We um, define the mass center. If I find this sum of MI times RI and then divide by the total mass, I'll find a distance or a ve this new vector that's going to locate where our center of mass is. Okay? And this, if you notice, is the this is the first moment over the zeroth moment. Right? The bottom one just equals total mass of the system or, or that collection of particles. And a collection of particles that are, are um, can be we have an infinite number of particles in a rigid body, then you could you could calculate this too by inspecting each of them, and then maybe you can imagine that these sums could turn to integrals, then for a continuous rigid body form. Okay, questions on that? So these that's the definition of um, mass of a particle rigid body and then the mass center of a collection of particles. And we can use this too to a collection of particles can represent a rigid body if we have an infinite number of them. Any questions on those two?
Okay, let's look at a little example here. Um, I think I can do it on this side of the page. All right, so we have three masses in this example, um, which are three particles. And I'll make a little sketch here. Actually, I think I'm going to go to a new page. This is, I'll be too tight. Does anybody not have that page? All right, so I'm going to sketch out a little coordinate system here. And we'll call this A1, A2, and A3 hat. And then I'll add some particles. So in this A2, A3 plane, we'll have P2. And then another particle here, P3. And another particle in this plane, P1. All right, so three particles. Um, we can specify the position vectors of them in this A frame. And uh, each of those, those particles have an associated mass. Now, if I, um, I'm going to draw then a line that em emanates here from, call this point O, and this line lies along a unit vector in hat. And then I'm going to also add a point B, so it's a, li a line <coughs> excuse me, that passes through O and B, and this vector in hat is the, um, gives us the direction and orientation of that line. So the question I want to ask here is, uh, can we vary M3 some amount to move the mass center of these three particles to get the mass center as close to, um, sorry, as close as possible to line OB. So these three particles have some mass center relative to them that's somewhere in between them. If I increase or decrease the mass of M3, can I ensure that the mass center falls on that line or get it as close as possible in that case? So what we can do is let's use our definition of mass center. So we'll let P star be the position vector from O to S star, All right? And then let's define M1 as M, M2 as 2M, and M3, I'm going to call it mu, All right? This mu is going to be this unknown mass value. We get to play with that value to try to get the mass center where we want it to be. And we can write out using the definition 
of mass center, we have the sum of pi mi from i equals 1 to 3 all over the sum of mi 1 to 3, the total mass. And if we plug those in, we're going to get m a2 plus a3 plus 2m a1a3 for the second mass, and then the third mass u a1 plus a2. And I think I've missed defining something that the um, forgot to tell you this. It's the location are all one in that given unit, in that given um, coordinate, right? So they're all located at one unit over. Sorry about that. So if, if they're all one unit over, then all the measure numbers on those vectors are one, and then I just multiply the mass times the vector that we have there. And then the total mass is going to be m2 plus mu. So this is an expression, a vector expression, of the location of the mass center. And we get to play around with the value of mu. So <clears throat> how could we define the distance from that point, P star, it points to, to this line. Take a few minutes and chat with your neighbor to see if you can come up with a way that we could make an expression for the distance from the line to wherever P star is. And we, ha we know what P star is, and we have... Um, and we know that n is some arbitrarily defined vector. We'll just call it n hat. I'm not going to say specifically what it is, but how, how, if you knew the, you know, exactly what n is in terms of its orientation in, in A, how would you find that distance?
you've got an idea, why don't you tell your neighbor and see if, see if you have similar ideas. Anybody got an idea here? How we find the distance? <coughs> Who's got an idea? Heard a lot of talking. There's got to be something there. So if you wrote both of them in terms of A1, A2, and A3, um, and you made the measure numbers of P star the same as in hat, would that put it in the right position? What do, does anybody think that what was wrong? Got an idea in that? Is that in that? The length of N1, this is only one unit long, and this is not one unit long. Could be, but it's not in general. So if you, if you match the measure numbers, proportional, yeah. So you could, um, if you found a unit vector that was a long P star, and you match the measured numbers of that unit vector in, in N, then, you would, then they would be aligned. So yeah, that would that would get you there. Any other ideas on finding specifically the distance though from P star to OB? What we got here? OP 
So if I say, uh, how do I want to do that? Um, I'm going to say that the length of OB in the in hat direction crossed R from, actually, let's write this in the notation we normally do. So R from B to O, O to B, crossed with R from what to what? O to P star. Okay. So if, if I look at those two vectors, say I have P star and N hat, and then further along there's this, this vector, R from B to O, O, B, P star. If I cross if I cross this into that, I get a, I'll get a, a vector that's perpendicular to those two. And how does that help us? Chris? And using a dot product. So um, if that vector is perpendicular to these, and I, it, and I projected it onto it, it'd be zero, right? But this cross product is the, um, if I change it to, let's see, if I do n crossed p star, that equals the magnitude of p star, sine of the angle of the theta, uh, if that happens to be theta, that could be helpful. Projection, though, is, uh, can be helpful, too. If I have, uh, if this is P star here in hat, if I project P star onto in hat, Right? Is that not the deep? Is that the distance I'm, we're looking for? And if if theta is this, and we know, we know the length of this, and we want that, and the relationship here is uh, sine sine of theta. I think, I think we're getting somewhere. We got in, some terms. If I say that um, we'll put theta here again and that uh, d over the magnitude of p star equals sine of theta. And up here we can also say that the sine of theta equals p magnitude of p star, I'm sorry, n hat cross p star over p star. So this is supposed to be magnitude, right? The magnitude of that cross product? Is that what you were thinking, uh, Gong? Yeah. So I think that's... The magnitude of that cross product should be the, the right length. And you could also write... Cross products and dot products are interchangeable, too, um, with the right rule. But um, if I uh, take in and I... I'm sorry. If we project P star with the dot product onto N, and then I make that projection in the N hat direction, I think that equals. 
that too. So if I take P star, right, and, I, and this, new, this vector here is the projection of P star on N in the N direction, which would be that length. If I subtract that vector from this vector, I should I would get the vector between them too. Right. So you can write it like this using dot products or do we got I just want to make sure I got that right because that's not how I wrote it too, but if the uh, am I doing something funny here? Oh, yeah, the, that's the magnet magnitude of this. I think that's correct. Yeah, all correct too. In cross P star tells you the length, um, that same length. All right, so that this is our this is our distance. Now, um, come right uh, right here. Now assume that n hat equals a1 hat plus a2 hat plus a3 hat, all divided by the square root of 3, the magnitude. So it's just a vector pointing um, equal angle from all of those uh, unit vectors that define a. And then this is our d. I'm not going to write it all out, but uh, d squared would end up being 2 mu squared minus 3 mu m plus 3m squared, all divided by 3m plus mu squared. So if you fill in these with all the values that I've given you, you should be able to get to this expression. And how would we find the, the mu value that would um, make d that make d smallest? Take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So if I do d d mu equals zero, then I could find the correct mu. And uh, I'll just give you what that turns out to be, but um, dd mu, you can get it to look like m square root of 6, 9m minus 5 mu, all over 6 m squared plus 2m mu plus mu squared times the square root of, see if I can fit it, m3 squared, 3m squared minus 3m mu plus mu squared. And if I set that equal to zero, turns out that mu has to be 9m over 5. All right? for it to be minimal. And if, if those vectors that point to the particles span the space that n is in, you could always get that mass center on the line. But for, but for example, if P1 and P2 um, were um, in the same plane, you may not be able to get it on the line if it if it if it doesn't it's fully span. But that'll get you as close to the line as possible. And um, if P1, P2, and P3 are um, span the um, basis of n hat, then you you would be able to get it on the line too. Questions there on using the center of mass mass center. So this. Uh, this is a particle definition, and um, formally what the zeroth and second moments of inertia 
R for a body. And I think that, uh, I don't know if I should, we only have five minutes left, and if I start on the next stuff, I think that's premature. So ne next time we'll talk about um, the second moment of, an er of, an, of mass, which is going to be um, a formal definition of the mass distribution in a, in a rigid body, the inertia. And you may have seen, um, worked with inertias too. Um, how, do you how do you sort of typically de describe the inertia of a three-dimensional rigid body? Does anybody remember that? Yeah, so if you um, integrate over the density, uh, integrate the density function with respect to volume, and, uh, well, no, there's, there's more to it than that. You, um, but what's, um, not the integral form, but uh, how did, if I ask, if I, uh, how, how have you described the inertia of a body um, in 102, typically. There's sort of some numbers that you gotta, you gotta define, usually to describe inertia. That's probably my, my question's too vague, I guess. Um, do you recall a, an inertia matrix? How many, how many value, how big is this, what's the size of this matrix that, that typically? Three by three. So a three by three matrix, um, and that has nine numbers in it. And what are, are do you recall anything special about any of the numbers? Yeah, so each row corresponds to, we'll say, um, x hat, y hat, z hat, as well as each column. So this, this has to be tied to a specific reference frame that you're asking about the inertia. And then, you Call anything else about what these values typically are inside? So you can, you might see them written then as IXX, IYY, IZZ, IXY, IXZ, IYX, IYZ, IZX, I. ZY. How many people have seen that? Only a few? Most? Okay. So, a couple things to remind yourself of is that these three values are the moments of inertia. These values are the products of inertia. And in general, Ix, any product of inertia, equals its opposite across this line of symmetry here. And these are symmetric matrices. And thus, only six of the values are needed to fully describe the inertia of a three-dimensional rigid body. And we'll talk about what the difference in moments and products of inertia are next time. Okay? Thank you very much. And um, I will see you guys in class Wednesday.